Welcome everyone to the session on Embracing Yoga's Roots featuring Susanna Barkataki. My name is Talitha Maitland and I'm one of the tri-chairs of this conference and the STEM librarian at Cal State San Marcos. I'm a biracial Vietnamese American cis woman. I have medium length dark, ha dark hair. My pronouns are she, her. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. And as part of our CFA practices, we're going to start off today with a land acknowledgement, a grounding in and with our interruption pra practice statement. We want to acknowledge that we gather as the California Faculty Association on the traditional land of the indigenous people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit as well. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who've been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Acknowledging the land is an important indigenous protocol that we are honoring here today. And I see it's pasted over into the chat and to find the native lands in which you reside, you can click on that link. I am a guest on um, Kumeyaay land uh, where I work and live. And you can find out where you are at that link. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Susanna Barkataki an author and Indian yoga practitioner in the Hatha yoga tradition. Yeah. Susanna is the founder of the Ignite Yoga and Wellness Institute and runs Ignite Be Well 200-500 yoga training programs. With an honors degree in philosophy from UC Berkeley and a master's in education from Cambridge College, Bargataki is a diversity, accessibility, inclusivity, and equity yoga unity educator who created the groundbreaking honor Don't Appropriate Yoga Summit. Susanna, the floor is yours. It's such a pleasure and joy to be here with you all. I wanted to just note that I'm learning a lot and really appreciating your interruption practices and um, really feeling welcome and grounded as this is something I also all often attempt to do and find myself the only one. And so I hope you're feeling that sense of community together um, and that we'll, we'll go deeper and practice together. So I wanna begin by introducing myself. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm coming to you from Tataviam and Chumash land. I'm partially blind. I'm a light-skinned South Asian person in my mid forties and I have long dark hair. I, I'm really, really excited to bring some movement and some embodiment practices to you all with the intention of grounding the work that we do in tools that can help us sustain over the long haul. And so to begin, I will use one of the tools that I'll share with you, which is I'm going to invite a bell and this is a, a bell from the 17th century from Nepal. You'll hear it over the, over the airwaves, but you can use anything as a bell um, in your daily life. You can use the vibration of your phone. You can set a timer. And the way that I invite you to work with this tool, and I'll invite us to work with it now, is when you hear the bell to come back to your breath. And we'll take maybe three or five deep breaths together. You can have your eyes open or closed. And if you find your mind getting distracted, you can come back to noticing, am I still hearing the sound or is the sound gone? So you're ready to practice with me? We'll try this on.
And breathing in, aware of your inhale. Breathing out, aware of your exhale. Your inhale, lengthening. Now your exhale, relaxing, letting your body settle. And much of life is this dance between action and then pausing or resting. And in every inhale and exhale, and let yourself feel a little bit of energy on the inhale and a little bit of ease on your exhale. So we'll practice like this on three more breaths. Inhale, energizing or awareness. Exhale, ease. One last breath, consciously together. And on your exhale, you can make a sound or a sigh, maybe wiggling or moving your body. And as we come back together, you can blink your eyes open if they were closed and look around the space that you're in, taking in form and color, shape, stretching. and we'll come together. So I'm going to share my screen. So we have breathed and welcomed ourselves. Goals for our time together is what tools can we cultivate for care and healing justice? And how can we practice yoga for managing stress or building mindful resilience? If you would like, you can grab a journal or something to write on or with. Um, you don't need that, though. You can just take this in and watch the recording if you want to go back. I will be offering you some tools that you can use again and again to cultivate mindful resilience. Who am I? Um, I think the most important thing about me is I see myself as a yoga culture activist. And really what that means is reconnecting yoga in the West with its heritage and its cultural roots. And this is an image of me um, sitting in the Gandhi ashram in Wardha, which uh, is in central India, learning how to spin homespun khadi cloth. Um, and that khadi cloth is, it's um, self-made cotton. It's not produced in a factory. It's made on a, a loom. And this cloth was a tool of the independence movement in India when the British said to Indians, you know, you have to produce all the raw material. We're going to take it, make it into clothing and sell it back to you for 10 times the price. Indians said, no, we're going to create our own clothes. And that has become a symbol, one of the many symbols of the Indian independence movement. And the charka, the wheel, is on the Indian flag even today. And so that story for me is, is so much central to who I am in the world, which is someone seeking self-sovereignty and to share that sovereignty with others, mostly through the tools of yoga and social justice. Um, the, the other things I put on the slide, I won't read them all, but uh, the other interesting thing you might be um, surprised to hear is I'm really shy um, in, in part why I turned to the tools of yoga when I began teaching as a K-12 educator. I worked in high school for about 16 years. And the only way I could do that job was by practicing meditation and yoga every morning before I went to work. And it's the same now, um, before I do presentations like this, I really have to, to practice in order to be able to show up and do what I do. Um, so what we will cover 
a little bit of history on yoga and meditation. Obviously, there's much there, not all of it. Um, why you or others in your community, maybe not you, but others around you may not feel like you belong in yoga spaces, but why you actually do. Some brief movement and mindfulness practices to support you and how to turn the challenges that we face into allies for practice. And then I also wanted to cover the benefits of yoga and meditation because it helps me to remember all the ways that it's supporting me. And we will do a brief practice and then there'll be time for Q&A. So I wanted to begin with a spiritual lineage acknowledgement in similar to the ways that we do land acknowledgement to Note that yoga and meditation are practices developed, organized, and codified in Asia, and particularly in um, Northwest India and Pakistan, the region of the Indus Valley and the Saraswati River Valley, some three to you know four thousand years ago, and that yoga has always had a perspective of seeking to heal trauma and alleviate inner and outer anguish from ancient times. Yogis, rishis, sannyasis, um, all different ways of saying yoga practitioners were involved in practices to find freedom from suffering. Why does this matter? Well, yoga has been part of movements for freedom and liberation from thousands of years ago to the independence movement, like I shared a little bit of, to current movements right now happening worldwide, but in India particularly for land sovereignty, for women's rights, trans rights, and farmers' rights. And yet that's not what we see when we look around us in yoga spaces or mindfulness or meditation spaces. Yoga means unity. Literally, it translates from the root yuj, union, um, to mean unity. But in the West, in yoga, there's so much separation. Many of us haven't felt included or welcome or represented in yoga spaces. Um, you know, if we were having a conversation and I asked you, have you, do you feel welcome in yoga space? You could answer that for yourself. I know for myself, um, I'm, you can't tell from Zoom, but I'm a curvy woman. I'm short. Uh, I'm not very flexible which I know is funny because I'm a, I teach yoga teacher trainings, but I'm not. And, um, and I often don't feel welcome in yoga studios and yoga spaces. My aunts and uncles who are Bengali and Assamese from India, my aunts were saris, you know, they'll say to me, beta child, like, I want to do yoga. They're like in their seventies and eighties, but I don't, I don't, I can't go to a yoga studio. Um, and so if you think of even if you yourself feel comfortable in these spaces, why might someone not? Well, there's so many of us who aren't there, right? Just folks with disabilities, veterans, folks with traumatic brain injuries, um, folks of color a lot of the time, folks with bigger bodies. So there's so many reasons why we have not been included or felt welcome. And it's not an accident. It's connected to systemic oppression and normative culture. All of this is operating in a system of power and dominance and connects to cultural appropriation. But, but the reason why this is important, besides the fact that it's important to honor culture and, and where these practices come from, is that it keeps us or people who could benefit from feeling like we can access these practices. So cultural appropriation is based in a system of oppression and involves power and dominance. It's when a dominant group with power takes from a marginalized group that has less systemic power. Um, there's many examples, I won't go into all of them, but for I'll, I'll give you one, for example, when you see uh, the sacred symbol Om, which we'll explore some different practices of sound later, Om A U M uh, literally means like it's like the sound of the universe, and it's sacred to many yoga practitioners. But it's used on marketing materials. I've even seen it um, 
the symbol OM put on parking spots or yoga mats, which is a really disrespectful thing to do to take a, like a symbol of the divine and put it um, somewhere so utilitarian. So power also creates access or lack of access, and it defines who's seen as healthy or fit or even a yoga practitioner at all. But for our purposes, um, and this is part of the lineage that I come from, you know, my teacher is in the Shankaracharya lineage, and he always says, uh, we all have bodies, which means we all have yoga bodies. We can all do yoga. And as a lineage, there's many different yoga lineages, but he, um, he is a Brahmin, which is um, of, the, of the group who are scholars of the scriptures. And he teaches yoga to outcast folks and Dalit folks. So folks who historically were denied access because of systemic oppression and power. And so the, the aim of his teaching and then therefore mine through this lineage is that to bring yoga to anywhere where it's useful, right? Anywhere where it's helpful. And so that everyone who can encounter yoga feels that you are what a yoga practitioner looks like. And so if you, someone in your life or you've thought, oh, I can't do yoga, I can't touch my toes, right? Or I'm not flexible enough, um, or I can never do yoga, that you could just say, oh, well, if you can wiggle a finger, you can do yoga. If you can breathe, you can do yoga. You don't even have to be able to move to do yoga. And so if we explore cultural appreciation rather than appropriation, we can begin to balance power. Sharing our power, using privilege or advantage to uplift or support under-resourced people or groups. And then one of the aspects of yoga is yoga philosophy, which there's much more to say about, but the, probably the most important principle is ahimsa. Uh, ah uh, is not, himsa is harm. And so we're reducing or mitigating harm, actively uplifting the source culture and also the people we're engaging with, bringing care and respect. And um, this can be done financially, socially, politically, emotionally, culturally. So let's explore. Um, remembering that yoga is unity. If you have a body, you can do yoga. If you have a breath, you can practice yoga or meditation. And so I want you to explore for just a moment. We've talked a little bit, but what brings you, your mind, your body, your heart into union? Um, what are the things that actually bring you kind of together in that way. And, and it may be like officially doing yoga, right? Movement and breath. But for some of you, it might be cooking. It might be dancing. It might be cuddling your dog or your cat or your kiddo, or, you know, it might be journaling. It might be having a great conversation with dear friends. Um, these are practices of resilience and restoration and bringing our awareness to those also helps cultivate that. So we're gonna practice um, some simple practices, light movement to connect with our breath. And these are somatic tools to burn off fear, burst, boost confidence and amplify power um, because ultimately yoga really is, it's cultivating Shakti, um, S-H-A-K-T-I is how you spell Shakti. And Shakti is that personal power that all of us have that no one can take away from us and no one can give to us. And when we've cultivated it, we want to create ahimsa, non-harm, not just for ourselves, but for others. So there's a lot in yoga philosophy that connects it to justice practices. Um, but for our purposes, I think we'll stop there and actually do some, some practice. Yeah, perfect timing. So the once that I wanted to share with you, um, I wanted to show you first and then we'll do them, our mindfulness of breath, which we started with, um, mindfulness of the body with some chair-based stretching, exploring things that can be bells of mindfulness, something that can just bring you back 
to take a pause. Practice in compassion. And then movement breaks. So sitting, standing, forward folding, chairs, uh, stretch in your chair or at the wall. So I'm gonna pause for a moment and just say, to leave that any questions or comments before we move into the, into a practice. None have come in, so I think we're okay to move on. Okay, great. And if folks have questions, please put them in the Q and A. Um, I'm re, I, we will have time for Q and A at, at the end, and I'm more than happy to to answer questions or address any concerns or doubts that you might have. So I think what I'm going to do is stop sharing so you can see my body while I am moving. And you can, we'll begin seated, but I'll give you the option to stand um, as we practice. So as we begin, I'd like you to take a moment to just notice anything happening in your life right now. So if, there, if you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious or stressed, like maybe any challenges. And so just bringing awareness to that. Your eyes can be open or closed. And then is there a quality or a way of being that can help you? For example, for me, if I'm feeling impatient, particularly with my kiddo or work, then maybe the quality is patience. If I'm feeling overwhelmed, then maybe the antidote quality is spaciousness. And so when you find a word that's your antidote, I invite you to breathe in with that word, like inhale, patience, exhale, patience. And so we'll practice as we move, bringing that word in. So to begin, if you're sitting in a chair, you can inhale your arms any amount up away from the chair, out with your fingers pointing out to either side. And then exhale, bring your hands up above your head, again, any amount. On your next inhale, bringing that word with you, perhaps patience or love and twisting in one direction. And you can use your chair to help you twist I'm using the arm of my chair. You can also use the back of your chair. And we'll take about three breaths here. Opening your heart. If you're not sure how to twist, it can be helpful to twist from your belly, then your chest then your neck and chin, and then even your eyes twisting around behind you. Breathing in and out. One last breath here. And then we'll inhale, lifting your arms up. Once again, any amount above your head. And then exhale, twisting the other direction. Once again, taking a moment here to breathe in from your belly, then your heart twisting around, chin, nose, eyes. Inhaling care, exhaling care. Inhaling strength, exhaling strength. We'll take a few more breaths here. So in yoga, there's particular categories of poses like twists, which can be really refreshing. There's also standing poses, forward folds, balancing poses. One more breath here. Inhale your arms up above your head. And we're going to move into a forward fold. And so for this, you can choose if you want to fold, maybe you have a desk in front of you and you want to I'll demonstrate, you can bring your hands out and just rest your forehead on your hands, or maybe you don't and you want to place your hands on your legs. 
Um, if you want to put a cushion underneath your body or like me, I have a soft belly, so I might lift my belly up a little bit and kind of allow my where my body touches my thighs to just rest, folding my arms. And the aim with forward folds as you're here is to bring your attention down towards the earth. So it does not matter how far you come. What's helpful is that you're just allowing your attention to fall down into the earth and for the earth to support you. Inhaling calm, exhaling calm whatever your quality is. And now slowly coming up, letting the transition be just as much a part of the practice as the practice. And we'll move into a heart opener, which is another kind of yoga shape. So there's many ways to do this. You can place your hands on the chair behind you and then stretch your heart forward. That's one way to practice. If you'd like, you can also bring your arms behind you and use your hands to clasp your wrists. Again, opening your heart, maybe tilting your chin up any amount towards the sky. And then another option would be, I'll just show you like this, to bring your hands together. Mine don't go all the way, but to reverse uh, in prayer pose behind you, which naturally just allows the shoulders to rotate backwards. So anywhere you are there, opening your heart, breathing your quality in, inhale joy, Exhale, joy. One more breath. You can release that. So we're going to practice now a balancing shape. Balance is really good, especially if you have like a really racing mind or a really driven kind of focused mind, which a lot of us as activists or organizers, we might have, because when you're balancing, it's hard to be anywhere, but in that focus of like, how do I stay right here balanced? And so there's options for this. Let me pull my camera down. So you can practice in your chair and I'll show you the chair version first placing one foot up on one leg. Um, so lifting, for example, I have my left foot up on my right knee and you can stay right there. This is one version of tree pose and then your hands can come together at the heart or rest on your chair, your choice there. Or another option is to stand and hold on to a, a desk, a chair if your chair doesn't move and to bring your foot, one foot up into your thigh on the other leg. This is tree. You can stay here using something to help you balance or bring your hands together and then allow your gaze to rest on something in front of you. And we'll do both sides. So right now we're just on the same side. Breathing in your quality, breathing out feeling movement in stillness and stillness in your movement. Um, I notice my foot wiggling as I try to balance here. And it's okay if you fall out, you can always just come back in. And take one more breath and then shift sides. So bringing that leg down, other foot comes up, any amount. So your toe can be on the ground, against your calf, against your thigh. You can be holding on, you can be seated on the other side. You can be laying down on the ground and practicing 
tree. So like a tree on this other side, feeling your roots, feeling yourself grounded down into the earth, drawing sustenance from the earth up into you. And then imagining your branches, you know, whatever you're creating or moving towards, your leaves, your buds, your fruits, letting the sun nurture that and drawing sustenance from the elements for your endeavors, your creations. And breathing in and breathing out. One more breath here. And then slowly, gently coming out. Our last moving shape that I wanted to demonstrate with you is going to be um, option for in your chair or at the wall, um, a downward facing dog. And so for this, you can place your hands on the wall or on the floor and then extend through your legs and through your arms. And you can see I'm using the chair. So you could literally just kind of sit up out of your chair and extend your legs out and your arms out. Or if you don't have a desk, you can use your chair wherever you would like. You can use the back of your chair as well. And stretch through your feet, through your legs, out through your arms. Breathing in your quality out that quality. In power, out power. This is an, an active pose. Soft bend in your knees, lengthen a little bit more, pushing away through the crown of your head and down into the earth. And then slowly inhale up, stretching your arms once more, any amount above your head. And then exhaling, letting your arms come down. And we'll take a moment, maybe a minute or two in a Shavasana, which is a resting pose. So you can take your resting pose seated, standing, lying down. Um, any way that your body is comfortable. So make your choice here. It could even be one of the shapes that we did. And we'll begin our rest by practicing samavritti breathing, which is equal parts breathing. We breathe in for four and out for four. If your breath goes on a different rhythm, and please modify and do what works for you. So we'll breathe in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. And you can continue breathing like this or allow your breath to just flow naturally. Letting yourself rest. Receiving the benefits of even this short practice, letting your mind relax, face relax and soften, shoulders, Soften.
chest and back soften. Belly and hips release. Lower back and thighs release. Knees, calves release and rest. Feet relax and allowing any tension to pour out through the bottoms of your feet into the earth. You can take it and compost it. Nothing to do, nowhere to be. And gently allowing your fingers to rub against your thumbs Deepening your breath. Hmm. Maybe wiggling or stretching if there's some part of you that would like a little more movement. And slowly looking around you. Reconnecting as you look around your space to that quality that you want to bring through your day. For me today, it's definitely patience. <laughs> so maybe noticing something in your space that represents that for you. I have a potted plant that is growing very slowly. So anchoring that in, that quality, your quality, and then we'll come back together. Thank you for practicing. Uh, I want to make sure we have time for questions and answers. I still don't see any questions yet, so I'm going to take a moment to just share my slides with the benefits of the physical benefits and the mental benefits of yoga and meditation. Because for me, it really helps me make the time to practice, even if it's just a minute or three minutes every day. I mean, I'm busy like many of you, you know, I have work and I'm a caregiver for elders and a young uh, little, little being. And I find that reminding myself of why I'm practicing helps me do it. And that my practice doesn't have to just be on a yoga mat or on a cushion. It can be a little brain break in the middle of work day. Um, mindful steps. So just to show you what we did, um, we did some these practices. We did some of Riti breathing, which is equal breathing. Um, it's written about in the Vedas. It's been practiced for thousands of years. And um, any kind of meditation could be focusing on an inner light, could be literally looking at a candle, focusing on a sound, we did that, could be the sound ah, could be a word, like the word that I invited you to reflect on. Or if you want to go more into yogic practices, traditionally um, sounds like om or other mantra. Then we also reflected on things that might be causing resistance um, for me often, like what stops me from practicing is that I'm already irritated or I'm already frustrated or angry or whatever it is. And so that itself, the frustration can be a mindfulness bell. What do I need? Am I hungry? Am I tired? You know, am I, am I um, thirsty? And it's the same way checking in on those physical needs, like emotionally, what do I need? Oh, I'm overwhelmed. 
oh, I need patience. I'm stressed. Oh, okay. I'm going to just like put my phone down, drop all the things and just be present with the people I'm in the meeting with or in the room with. And just a reminder, right? Like um, as teachers, as, as activists, we might be experiencing so much stress. It's our work environments, personal health concerns, global health concerns, discrimination, racism. Um, there's so many things that we are facing. And so this opportunity to, to practice can really support our personal resilience, but also the resilience of our communities and our movements. And so just a moment to reflect, for you to reflect or to ask, you know, how might these techniques help manage mental health and build resilience for you or for your communities um, in this time? And meditation is not about being, uh, meditation is about being fully present with everything that is, including discomfort and challenges. It is not an escape from life. Um, so let me, yes, here's what I wanted to share with you. The physical benefits of meditation and yoga. Uh, and this, I put the sources in the bottom right. Um, they're from a number of different sources, but the, Meditation and yoga lower high blood pressure, lowers the level of blood lactate, reducing anxiety attacks, decreases tension-related pain, um, such as tension, headaches, ulcers, insomnia, muscles, and joint problems, increases serotonin, hormones that cause more feelings of joy and connectedness that improve mood and behavior, improve the immune system, an increased energy level as you gain an inner source of energy. Um, and there are other benefits. So these are just some of the ones I wanted to pull out. And then mentally, um, the benefits of yoga and meditation decrease anxiety, build emotional stability, increase creativity, increase happiness, increase calm, increase clarity and peace of mind, helps us solve problems and focus. And so there's many, many uh, benefits. The benefits, uh, especially um, Richard Davidson, who is a, a monk and then also became like a neuroscience researcher. What was, was really profound in the research that he did is a lot of these benefits are the same, whether you practice for three minutes or 10 or you know, an hour. And so that for me is very heartening because it means that for people who have a whole host of things to do, we're still going to experience the benefits from practice. The other side though is consistency does increase the benefit. So if like we practice today, if you practice again tomorrow um, or the next day or the next day, your way, what works for you, you will in experience increased benefit from consistency of practice. It's okay though, if you don't in a month, a year later, you remember you'll still get benefit then. So with that, I will stop and um, pass it to Talitha if there's any questions or comments. We did get in a couple and I think this is what we have time for. And I think they're really relevant to all of our work as educators and also in activist circles. Uh, the first one is from Filiberto Nolasco. Filiberto asks, can you say more about the relationship to trauma or trauma recovery? I think from yoga and the relationship to trauma or trauma recovery. Thank you, Filiberto. Um, there's so much to say about trauma and trauma re recovery. And there's a lot of wonderful work being done on trauma-informed yoga today. And trauma-informed yoga, although they didn't use the term trauma-informed, has always been part of the yogic tradition because really, I mean, and I'll use current day terms, but the practices that are there for us are there to help us regulate our nervous systems and, you know, be able to come into a more um, calm or aligned state. So we're not triggered and even move out of like 
for example, PTSD or states where we're consistently anxious or triggered into a kind of more homeostasis state. There are different terms and words that the texts used from thousands of years ago, but they overlay almost exactly on a lot of the current terms that we use. So for example, I just wanna give you one specific concrete example. Um, doing something like even what I'm doing right now, right? Placing a hand on your heart or if you prefer on your legs or crossing your arms, things that we do naturally in yoga are mudra. They're shapes that create a certain effect. And so by doing these shapes, we're self-regulating. We're creating a kind of tending to ourselves to help ourselves find stability, calm, right? If we do this, maybe focus. And so um, yoga as a practice is always going to be helpful or should, you know, well-taught yoga should be helpful um, for reducing trauma. Now, I do want to give one kind of proviso, which is to say that uh, it doesn't mean that triggers won't occur. Triggers, of course, can still occur even in yoga classes. For example, some people may not want to close their eyes. Closing the eyes could be like when we did the, the guidance at the end, um, Shavasana, maybe that causes a trigger and, and raises trauma, right? So I don't know if you noticed in my cueing, I tried to cue in an invitational way. Um, I may not have done it perfectly. There may have been things I did or said that did trigger things for you. And so ideally in yoga spaces, we're working with who's in front of us and trying to make sure that we're addressing the needs of, of those people. Um, you can ask me more if you have more questions. I love that. that idea of inviting um, mm. rather than like forcing someone to do something, you know, um, because then we can take that into the classrooms too, like inviting our students, yeah. you know, like telling them to do stuff. Right. Getting consent, you know, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Okay, we have one last question from Paula Noguera. And Paula asks, how do you train your mind to calm down when you're always on the go? Yes, Paula, such a, such a great question. <laughs> um, I, I do many things, but one is, is remembering that, you know, meditation and yoga doesn't necessarily mean our minds stop. Like, it's not like my mind is empty when I'm meditating. I may have in a five minute meditation, a hundred thoughts or a hundred times that my mind wanders and I bring it back a hundred times. So it's actually, you know, then the yoga sutras, and maybe I should write this, but it says yoga chitta vritti narodaha. It's, it's a phrase in Sanskrit um, that means yoga is a supporting of the fluctuations of the mind. So our minds are going to always be going. From the beginning of time, the first yogis, their minds were distracted. Who knows what they were thinking about, right? But I'm sure they had dramas and stresses of, of their own and maybe injustices too that they, many of them were addressing. And yoga, it doesn't mean that stops actually. It just means we have ways to support the changes as they come. And so for me, a lot of the time, and, and you, it might be different, but for me, a lot of it is I go outside when I can. I lay on the ground, literally like lay my body on the ground and breathe and look at the sky or look at the earth, you know, and connect a lot of my outside is concrete. So I connect to the concrete and feel the warmth of the concrete. Um, say I can't do that. It might be literally taking a mindful step, like walking from my desk to the bathroom, breathing that word, right? Like if I'm stressed, maybe it's calm, 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 calm. So finding whatever practice supports you in like from these huge fluctuations, kind of calming and soothing the fluctuations. 
Um, but there's really no wrong way to do it, Paula. It's, it's what works for you. And also the biggest thing probably is bringing self-compassion. Like, you know, I've practiced yoga and meditation now for 25 years and I still, you know, get totally overwhelmed. My mind is still not calm most of the time. And I still experience anxiety, depression, you know, fear, all the things. And so it's not like there's a final destination. It's just bringing the tools back to support and, um, and hopefully being more, more present and more powerful in, in the things that I'm attempting to do. We only have a couple of minutes left and there is one question and maybe this is appropriate because we have very limited time and the question says, do you have any suggestions, tips for brief yoga practices when there's limited time to practice each day? And this is from Janeth Rodriguez. Yes, thank you, Janeth. I love this question. Absolutely. Um, you know, probably for me, I do a practice very similar to what I led for you. I have some free practices on YouTube that are short, that are just like 10 or 15 minute practices that you can do um, accessible as well. And so finding something, you know, it could be with me, it could be with anyone, right? But finding a practice that works for you. And then it's okay to do that again and again. If you need variety, then you can look for other teachers. But um, but doing some, some sitting, some twists, heart opener, you know, some stretching, forward fold, you don't need to do much to engage the whole body, especially if you're doing it with mindful breathing. So I hope that's helpful. 